tell you, over the years, I have discovered some bits of wisdom in my life. For instance, um, you never tell your dog to watch your food. <laughs> and something I learned really at a young age was when your dad says, do I look stupid or something, he's not asking for an answer. <laughs> Another thing I gleaned as a child was that if your sister or your brother is holding a baseball bat, you don't pick on them. <laughs> but all joking aside, you know, wisdom doesn't really have anything to do with knowledge. We can have all the book smarts in the world, but if we don't have wisdom, our lives are missing things. Real wisdom is is gaining and developing a moral insight with understanding of how to practically use the knowledge that we have. And you know, all the wisdom in the world isn't worth a hill of beans if it's not practical. If we can't use it, we call it trivia. All the wisdom of the world is meaningless unless it is evident in our lives, too. So we talk about how smart someone is, but we usually do that when we talk about how wise someone is by their life experiences and how they live their lives. But I'll tell you, if there was ever a time in this world that we needed the lesson on wisdom to sink in, right now would be it. Uh, I think each day, I'm scared to even look at the paper and the news to see what craziness is going on. If you'd like to turn with me to the third chapter of James for our reading this morning, uh, I'm going to actually be reading from the message, but if you'd like to follow along in whatever version you have, I invite you to do that. I'll be reading from the third chapter of James, beginning with the 13th verse, and I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. Do you want to be counted wise to build a reputation for wisdom? Well, here's what you do. Live well, live wisely, live humbly. It's the way you live, not the way you talk, that counts. Mean-spirited ambition isn't wisdom. Boasting that you are wise isn't wisdom. Twisting the truth to make yourself sound wise isn't wisdom. It's the furthest thing from wisdom. It's simply animal cunning, devilish cunning, conniving. Whenever you're trying to look better than others or get better than others, things fall apart and everyone ends up at each other's throat. Real wisdom, or God's wisdom, begins with a holy life and is characterized by getting along with others. It's a gentle and reasonable, overflowing with mercy, Overflowing with blessings, not hot one day and cold the next, not two-faced. You can develop a healthy, robust community that lives right with God and enjoy its results only if you do the hard work of getting along with each other, treating each other with dignity and honor. This ends the reading of our epistle lesson this morning. This is the word of God and it can't be trusted. Thanks be to God. Scholars have argued over the years, you know, James almost didn't make it in the Bible. You know, it, it was one of the last books of the Bible to be added because the folks who were putting the canon together uh, didn't think it had enough about Jesus in it. Because Jesus isn't mentioned in it. And it was actually written by the half-brother of Jesus, but... Uh, scholars have argued over the years about the context of the letter of James. Uh, he was the bishop of the church of Jerusalem. And some scholars argue that he was simply writing about the church community, the Christian community, and how to get along within that, that particular community. And other scholars have said, no, it goes much bigger than that. James is teaching us how to be Christians in a, in a world of non-Christians. And so, I think, for me at least, the words of James and the wisdom of James goes much wider 
than the limited <coughs> scope that some scholars would have us to limit his words to. For me, it talks about how we conduct our lives in the world. You know, our Christianity isn't limited to simply what's within these four walls. You know, our, our, our wisdom and, and living a Christian life extends way beyond what we do here on Sunday mornings. And I find that these words of James offer us some advice and direction in a very polarized world that we live in right now. I will be the first to admit that my Irish side sometimes does it best to push my Christian side to the back. My, I, I think I worked for Greeks for so long that uh, there are days where I lose the filter between my brain and my mouth and I say things or write things that I later regret. And so instead of speaking words of love and uh, blessing, sometimes I speak things that cause an angry exchange. But in this day and age, I think a lot of us are prone to follow our impulse to assign blame because that's sort of where we're at in this world right now. We, we assign blame for any situation that comes up where there are opposing points of view. You know, there was a day where we had civil discourse and we talked about, uh, we could sit down with someone with opposing points of view and, you know, even if we left the table not agreeing, we, we weren't ready to kill each other. But of course, you know, when we do that, we always believe that our side and our point of view demonstrates that gentleness that's born of wisdom while the enemy or the other side is always full of the greed and selfish ambition. We always picture ourselves in the full light and they're in the full dark and, you know, we're trying to eliminate them. As often happens, one side truly desires dialogue. And I have to admit that I, I generally want to have honest and open dialogue, but, but the it doesn't take much to flip my switch and to put me on the wrong path. But uh, instead of limiting our speech and listening to what the other one has to say, the exchange we, we have, whether it's in texting or social media or conversation, devolves into a rhetorical rant, and in the end, feelings are bruised and nothing gets settled. And I think... Our author today, James, encourages his readers, myself included, to respond with wisdom, which is from God. He tells us to yield what we feel is our wisdom to God's wisdom. And you know, we've talked over and over again about what it means to yield and how hard it is for us as humans to yield. Because every time we yield, we feel like we're losing control. We're giving up our control of something. We're, we're no longer controlling the situation. We're not controlling the conversation. We're not controlling the way people think. And we don't like that. We don't like that. But in James's letter, yielding to God's wisdom is not a forced situation. It isn't so much an action. It's not so much about what we're giving up as it is a result. Instead of yielding something, being a verb, he's talking about yielding as a noun. You know, the field yields a crop. If we are wise, it's not that we're giving something up. It's what in the end we're going to bring in. So James contrasts this world's wisdom, or our wisdom, our human wisdom, and what it looks like against divine wisdom, and the way we're called to conduct our lives as followers of Jesus. And at this point, we have the choice of either repeating and continuing in our past wisdom, or we can elect to move in a different path using God's wisdom. And he paints two different pictures of what that looks like. Later on in chapter 4, he even goes on to say, draw near to God and God will draw near to you. So 
So if we move towards God's wisdom, God's wisdom will come to us. So we each, every day, in all of our dealings, all of our talking, all of our dealings with other people, have the choice to either use earthly wisdom, our wisdom, our human wisdom, or we can use God's wisdom. And this one I can tell you, each one will produce its own kind of fruit. Each one will have its own consequences. And James says, be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. He contrasts that by saying, don't be a person with mean-spirited ambition. Don't be devilish or conniving. Because when you are, your world's going to fall apart. And you're going to end up at each other's throats. Sound familiar? May I call them? I'm guilty. Uh, I'm a guilty one. I'm the dog that's barking. <laughs> All you have to do is mention Trump and it sets me off. <laughs> but I, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. So even in James' day, there were conflicts that were bitter enough to provoke violence between two disagreeing parties. They were... You know, nothing's changed. Ever since Adam and Eve walked out of the Garden of Eden, or were pushed out of the Garden of Eden, of Eden what's the first thing that happened? The two sons, one of them kills the other one. So, disagreements have provoked violence from the beginning of time. So how do we resist without giving up our standards? How do we resist without feeling like we're failing? How do we disagree with someone that still call them into accountability. Well, obviously with nonviolence. <laughs> we don't kill each other because we don't get along with each other. That should be apparent to all the followers of Jesus. But I think a more subtle, nuanced piece of advice in this passage is the very closing words of it. Treat each other with dignity and honor. Respect one another. Even if we disagree with each other, respect each other's opinions. And that's hard to do. I'm here to tell you that is hard to do. But it's the Christ-like thing to do. If I treat my friends and my foes with respect and dignity, I still recognize that we are all children of God. You know, the Bible tells us that God calls us to reign to fall equally on the evil and the righteous. So we're all children of God. We're all beloved by God. As hard as that is for us to reconcile in our own ways. I don't have to like or agree with someone to treat them with respect and honor. And I have learned to use the unfriend button. <laughs> into uh, a shower match with someone. I'd rather just not hear from them and rather than disagree. But the wisdom that James envisions and inspires in us is a way of life that's born of walking humbly with God. It's a way of life that is boosted by God's Spirit. The one thing I will say is a part of my morning prayer every single morning is that God's Spirit will speak through me and not me through myself. I put that in my prayers every morning. Because James tells us, it doesn't matter what you say, it's how you act, it's how you live your life that will determine whether you're wise or not. So when we live in such a way that we're consciously aware of God's presence and His wisdom, we get this inner strength. It's always a strength that manifests itself in gentleness and kindness and meekness and humility. And sometimes self-sacrifice, which is really hard for all of us. I think James, as he spoke about a practical application of wisdom, may have had in mind a verse from an Old Testament prophet by the name of Micah. In the sixth chapter of Micah, the eighth verse, that prophet wrote, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk 
coming of the God. Folks, we know what is good, we know what is right. Following this advice that James gives us, to use God's wisdom instead of our wisdom, will be a sure sign that we're living well, living wisely, and living well. Thank you.